Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Tucker Allen Live on Facebook. If you've joined us before, these segments are about 15 minutes or so, where each week we like to cover a specific estate planning topic. And I'm Teresa Yao, and today I will be moderating, and I am joined by Kevin Mason, who is an attorney at Tucker Allen. Welcome back to Facebook Live, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me today, Teresa. Happy to have you here again. Um, and this is just a reminder to everybody that we also have other webinars and podcasts available. So if not all of your questions are touched on today, you can definitely access our different resources by visiting tuckerallen.com and clicking on the resource button. And we hold Facebook Live events every Friday. So if you have to hop out early on this one, you can join us again next week. And we also host monthly town halls. So I encourage everybody to join us for our February town hall. And while you're watching, or maybe after you watch today, if you think of some questions, feel free to submit your questions to tuckerallen.com slash questions. And we'll make sure to include those questions the next time we do a segment or a podcast, or even at the town hall. Um, so the last thing before we kick off today, just another quick reminder and disclaimer that an attorney-client relationship is not established um, through this webinar today. We encourage you to contact our office and make an appointment if you are seeking uh, legal advice. All right, Kevin. So today we will be dis discussing leaving gifts to beneficiaries, which really is at the core of a lot of people's estate planning goals, right? Yes, absolutely. Generally, whenever people come in, the reason that they're coming in is that they want to create a plan so they can transfer assets on to uh, their beneficiaries. So yes, this is absolutely the core. Of it. So it's a very important topic for us to touch on today. Yes. Um, so what are the options in estate planning um, for gifting to beneficiaries? Sure. So uh, I'll kind of break it down into two different um, options here, and then we can delve into those. So the first option might be or would be gifting during the grantor's lifetime. Um, so this is uh, the person comes in, they get an estate plan, and they want to uh, still give gifts to their beneficiaries while they're alive. So um, with that, there's a, a limit, a federal limit for gift tax. And in 2021, that limit is going to still be $15,000 um, per person per recipient. So that means if I had $15,000 that I wanted to gift to someone, if I only gift them 15,000 and no more, then I won't be hit with that federal gift tax level. Um, and then, but if you were married, if I was married, then it's then that doubles to thirty thousand per recipient that we could gift as a couple. And then there wouldn't be a tax on that. Correct. Great. Correct. That's um, a good um, exclusion to to have while you're alive. So. Sure. Absolutely. And then another um, option, kind of for gifts during uh, the grantor's lifetime, could uh, like a supplemental needs trust. Um, so yeah, go into that. Like, how do people utilize trusts to provide for beneficiaries during their lifetimes? Sure. So if I create a supplemental needs trust um, and I funded it, and then I had someone in my life that needed this supplemental help, um, then we could ma make sure that they maintained their Medicaid, um, that they were still on Medicaid during this time, but still provide for some of those needs that Medicaid might not cover. Um, so maybe some sort of educational materials that they would like, or, uh, you know, um, maybe gifts that they would like to give people. Oftentimes in our supplemental needs trust, we give uh, the option that the person can buy $50 gifts, which for someone which would not fall under Medicaid. So just things like that. And then during the grantor's lifetime, um, that will go to the beneficiary. And these supplemental needs trusts, they are kind of more applicable um, only for beneficiaries who are like disabled. Is that correct? Yes. So this would be for beneficiaries who are disabled. Maybe they um, have a genetic um, something there or maybe they were just in a car accident something like that okay got it so that's definitely a, a good way where if something comes up and you want to provide for your loved one it's like while you're alive you can do so without disqualifying them from any needs-based programs if i'm understanding correctly 
Yes, no, you absolutely are. And that's, that's the goal of the supplemental needs um, trust rules is to just provide for that individual without getting them disqualified. I wasn't really avoiding it, but I'm pretty good at procrastinating. I needed a trust. When I found Tucker Allen, all our questions were answered, all of our fears allayed. You want your wishes in place, so there's no guessing, no stress on the children. Basically, they talk about what you need, what's important to you. It was more conversational, really very simple. So we talked about gifting during a lifetime, but really in our world of estate planning, a big chunk of gifting is talking about gifting after um, death. So what sure. are the options that look like for that? Sure, so kind of the options after um, an estate plan matures would be uh, you know, a gift via a trust or a gift via a will. Okay. Um, so those are kind of the two main ones that we deal with. And then there's different types of trust that we deal with occasionally. But for, for the purposes of this, I'll just kind of focus on the revocable trust since that's, that's a large, or it's the larger majority of what we deal with, I would say. Are there like um, any specific benefits to gift via trust rather than maybe just leaving somebody as a direct beneficiary on your assets? Sure. So, um, Kind of the main benefit of a trust is that it just allows for so much more personalization of the way that this gifting occurs or the inheritance is going to occur. So whenever, if maybe if you, tell me if I'm wrong here, but were you thinking maybe if somebody just created a POD on their bank account? Yeah, exactly. Like what's the okay, benefit sure. of maybe having the trust as a beneficiary rather than just having your child directly. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, the personalization and that, so there's different ways then that we can set it up for this child to inherit the money, um, as well as a lot of times with financial institutions like that, let's say someone had two children or three children. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times a financial institution will allow you to name three beneficiaries to be payable on death, so POD, on this account, but what they will do is they won't make it to where you can set it up to say, okay, I would like, um, you know, this child to get 40%, and then I would like these other two children to get 30%, because, you know, maybe this child who's getting the 40%, they, they have a lower paying job, but Right. It's like if you have two kids and like, I'm just going by stereotype here, but mm -hmm. if one kid is like a doctor and the other one is a teacher, maybe sure. like in terms of equity, it might make sense to give more to the teacher. Um, right. So maybe like it's harder to designate that directly if I'm yes. understanding it correctly. In the POD. Yes. So it's much harder to, to designate that directly via the POD where it just you're going to have to split it equally amongst them. But with the trust, we can get it set up to where it's payable on death to the trust. And then within this trust document, we say, okay, this child who is the doctor in our scenario, they really, they don't need this maybe as much as the child who's the teacher. So we're going to give the majority of it to the child that is the teacher. So it just allows a lot greater personalization. Um, within a trust document as opposed to just having it uh, POD. And what are like other circumstances other than just like maybe like a salary difference between kids, but like what are other circumstances where it might not be a good idea to kind of give outright to your beneficiaries? Sure, so there's, there's a lot of other options like you were just suggesting. Uh -huh. So maybe someone just has problems managing their money, you know? Yeah. Um, Maybe they, as soon as they get money, it's burning a hole in their pocket and they just struggle to uh, hang on to it and invest wisely and things like that. So that might be an option where we just wouldn't want someone to get the money out right. Um, maybe somebody is dealing with mental health issues. So we might not want them to have all of the money just right away outright. Um, if they're on Medicaid or Medicare or something, we want to be able to preserve 
uh, their status on Medicaid or Medicare. Like that, their eligibility. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So we want to keep them on that. So that's another time where like that supplemental needs trust would come in. We wouldn't want them to just get all this money right away. Um, young adults even. Um, that's another option where we don't always want the person just to get this huge lump sum of assets right away. So I know, at least for me, probably at 21, I would not have been a good candidate to get a lot. <laughs> I think a lot of us probably. Most yes. People. <laughs> yes. Um, and then another thing is just that sometimes people have concerns with the spouse of their beneficiary. So that's another time. Oh, like where, son in law or daughter in law, like that? Right, where we might want to have it a little bit more personalized instead of them just getting that that gift or that inheritance outright. So, like, how do you personalize that in, in if it's like a trust and you want to give it to them in a trust, like, how do you personalize that to hedge those risks? Sure. So, for some of the risks where we were talking about, like, to preserve the eligibility on the uh, governmental assistance program, that would be a time where we could come in with a supplemental needs trust mm -hmm. and work from there. Another time, if it's just the issue is that, oh, well, I, I'm not sure if they're the best with money or they're like that young adult situation, then a really easy option is to say, you know what, let's, let's have this set up to where the beneficiary gets one third, one third, one third of the trust assets over a span of 10 years, let's say. So maybe they get... Um, 33% of the trust assets whenever they're 25. And then whenever they turn 30, we give them half of the remaining trust assets. So whenever they're 35, they get everything that's left. So hopefully that will work out to be about- Hopefully more. as they mature, it becomes safer and it's safer for them to get the full amount. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. And so kind of the last option that we have there would be to create separate sub-trusts within this trust. Um, and that's, that's a good option whenever, whenever all else fails and that's kind of your last option, just because having those separate sub-trusts, that means we're going to have to have a trustee that's going to work on this every year and they have to file taxes and there's things that, that they must do and they're going to probably take a payment for doing those things. So yeah. sometimes that's just something to think about with that separate sub-trust is that it is going to be more expensive. Yeah, and it's really, it's a, t correct me if I'm wrong, it's more just this balancing. Like if you're really concerned, like if there's a child that has, you know, addiction issues or something, mm -hmm. then there are circumstances in which it might be the correct option. And, yes. and like as you go along, you can certainly update your trust to change types of distributions, maybe yes. as you see your kids grow up. Is that correct? Absolutely. So trust, trust are very, you know, they can be personalized easily. You can get trust amendments very easily, not a big issue at all. You can change up that structure for how the assets are gonna be distributed. That's easily done as well. And like you were saying, it really is. It's just a balancing act of, of can this person handle, um, handle these assets in a responsible way? And then also how much do you want to really burden um, this potential beneficiary, you know, if they're halfway decent with money and it might not be necessary for them. Exactly. Yeah. They don't really have any issues. Do you really want to burden them with having the money tied up in a trust for their entire lifetime? Right. So really, I think the main takeaway is um, with all these situations, just take some time to talk with an attorney, an estate planning yes. attorney, and they can kind of, based on your family situation, provide you with some advice about which path is the most appropriate so absolutely okay well thanks so much kevin um i appreciate all of the helpful information i feel like we have a limited time with these facebook live segments and you squeezed in a lot of important nuggets of um, advice in there um, so to our viewers um, just tune in every friday we'll be covering different types of topics um, through our facebook live segments um, and they'll touch on different concerns for um, different potential client um, requests so if you're listening, if listening to our segment has inspired you to get started on your estate plan, which I really hope it has, remember to visit TuckerAllen.com to get more information on our attorneys and the different services that we offer. And you can call through 866-335-3375 to get in touch with a Tucker Allen attorney today. Thanks so much. Thank you.